So in the last couple of videos, we had talked about, you know, which, uh, trying to determine which observations to drop uh, or which observations have uh, or, or are very influential in OLS estimation. So in this video, we'll talk about um, an estimation method that is less sensitive to outlying observations or less sensitive to outliers. And this is called least absolute deviation method. Okay, so just like OLS is a method, least absolute deviation is also a method. And this has an advantage because it um, puts less weight on outliers, less weight on outliers in uh, determining the effect of um, X and Y. So let's think about an example here. So if we, you know, want to examine what is the effect of changing a covariate or an explanatory variable, and sometimes we are interested in policy interventions on something that, on features of the distribution other than the mean. Right, so let's take an example here. Maybe we want to understand how does eligibility in a particular kind of pension plan affect median wealth. So, so we are interested in median wealth, and this is our y, and x is eligibility. If you're eligible or not. for pension plan, right? So this is a, a zero one or a dichotomous variable. Okay, so here we might be interested in not the average wealth, but the median wealth, okay? Um, but we can also look at different parts of the wealth distribution if we want to, okay? The idea here is the reason we wanna look at the median is because the mean, because of these outlying observations because there's like maybe very, very wealthy people or people who have very little wealth, right? Um, in our, in our um, sample can um, influence the average effects or the mean effects that we typically capture uh, using OLS estimation. So we wanna rely on a different technique that pays less attention to the outlying observations and focuses on the median effects on, uh, on uh, the dependent variable. So remember that estimating the median of a distribution requires this method called least absolute deviations. And this method is different from OLS or ordinary, ordinary least squares. Um, and this method, LAD, uh, consistently estimates a, a median, okay? So there's no problem or there's no, it's just which method to use is what you need to decide based on your question. And uh, like I said, the motivation for using LAD is that it is pretty resistant to uh, the influence from outlying or observations or outliers, okay? So if you want to have an effective way uh, of limiting the influence of outliers, uh, then you can use LAD, okay? Uh, but, you know, there are, it's important to remember that there could be other reasons why OLS and LAD can give, give different results uh, that have nothing to do with extreme data points, right? So there could be missing observations, there could be um, proxy variables that you're using, there could be measurement errors, there could be a host of different things why the two uh, give you different results. So just kind of, you know, going back to your fundamentals here, when you think about, you know, OLS, we are talking about average or mean effects. And when we are talking about LAD, we are talking about median effects. So remember the difference between means and medians from your uh, intro to statistics courses. Um, the resilience of the median to extreme outcomes can be illustrated with a simple example here. So let's consider five values here, 0, 1, 4, 6, and 14. If you calculate the average, right, you summate over this vector and you divide it by the number of observations, which is five, right? We have five uh, observations here. So 
uh, if you take the sum of these, right, you add these up, this is 25 divided by 5, and 5 is the mean. However, the median is 4, right? Notice that median is like the middle value, right, or uh, the average of the middle values. So that is 4 here. We had 5 observations. Um, and so here, um, even though we have 14, which is looking very different than the rest of the uh, observations that are pretty much clustered together, 14 is very different. 14 has an influence with, on, on the average, but not on um, the, the median, okay? And you can even replace 14 with any number, 114, 114,000. Um, 114 million, you can make it, make that anything, but the median uh, value is still four, right? So if you had um, listed your, your observations in ascending order or descending order, this is going to be the middle value. Um, but the median, but the mean can change, right? Based on these outlying, uh, or these outlying observations or outlying values. Uh, and we see this a lot in economic data, such as, you know, when we think about housing values, income, um, typically reporting medians is better than reporting means because uh, of the influence of outlying observations. But both contain very useful um, information. Both medians and means are uh, useful. So let's say we were interested in uh, looking at the effect of the change in tax code. So maybe there is some change in tax code. Um, and this has some influence on the charitable contributions. Right? So suppose that a change in the tax code is estimated to dec decrease the mean charitable contributions by $145 per family in the U.S., but the median uh, decrease is only $52. Okay, we, we could, uh, we may want to know, uh, you know, the what is the aggregate decline in charitable contributions, right? So in in that case, we would just take a look at the mean change and multiply it by the number of families. So if we want to look at, at the aggregate picture, we can do this. If we want to understand what's happening at the median, then we look at the median. And in in terms of you know what that model looks like, you know you understand that. Um, we, we are starting with the same basic uh, model here, uh, and we are assuming that the, the variance of u is less than infinity, right? So it's, it's, uh, it's not too spread out. And there are different uh, ways to estimate the parameters of a linear model here. So we're just talking about different methods. OLS itself is basically when you minimize the sum of squared residuals. So sum of squared residuals are minimized. But in the LAD estimation or least absolute deviations method, we are only minimizing the absolute value of the residual. Okay. And it's important to not make the mistake when you're talking about, you know, the estimation method. So whenever you write out a model, this is not, don't call this an OLS model or an LAD model. Remember that OLS and LAD are actually estimation methods, right? When you write out some kind of a multiple linear regression model, that's just a linear regression model how you determine those betas or alphas uh, or deltas uh, depends on what estimation technique you are using. So it could be uh, ordinary least squares. It could be weighted least squares. It could be a least absolute deviation uh, and stuff like that. Okay. And a visual way to look at what these methods, these estimation methods are doing 
given their objective functions. Um, here's OLS, right? So OLS, um, if you're we basically plotting U square, because we are looking at minimizing the sum of squared residuals in the objective function, right? So this is telling you what U square is. And then this one, so U square is basically, this is from OLS, right? And then this one is minimizing the absolute value of U and this is from the LED method, okay? So notice that um, OLS actually uh, gives much more weight to large errors, right? So, and pretty symmetrically, right? Even LED is pretty symmetric, but uh, LED is not giving a large weight to extreme values or large errors. So it is more resilient to changes in extreme values because the median is much less sensitive to the mean uh, than the mean to changes in extreme values, okay? So remember that there's nothing wrong in, in doing OLS. It is just, it really depends. The technique that you use depends on the question you're trying to answer. Um, and remember that OLS consistently estimates the parameters um, um, and um, LAD also does that. The other type of regression that we encounter is called quantile regression, which is, uh, you know, more details are in the book. But basically, the idea here is if we did not want to look at just the 50th percentile, which is the median, um, and we wanted to look at what is going on across the entire distribution. So maybe we want to look at different quantiles or percentiles. So maybe we want to look at, let's say, if we were interested in looking at the effect of some kind of tax policy on wealth, right? So maybe we are not interested just in people who have median wealth. And so we don't want to just use... Um, or, or mean wealth, we just don't want to use um, OLS, but we are actually interested in, you know, the different uh, percentiles uh, of the wealth or the different quantiles of the wealth distribution. So maybe we are interested in the bottom 10% uh, and then, you know, what's going on at the median and then what's going on, you know, at the top of the wealth distribution. Um, because of, of the tax code changing, we can actually use quantile regression to do that, okay? Um, so, so we, off, we also say that the median corresponds to the quantile equals uh, equaling 0.5. So when we are talking about quantiles, Q stands for quantile, and uh, when we are looking at the center, right, uh, we are looking at what is going on at the median. So we are talking about Q equals 0.5, and that's what's going on at the median. But then if Q is equal to 0.1, we are talking about what's going on with the bottom 10%. Okay, so um, the objective function here is sometimes called the check function because it looks like the check or sometimes a backward check mark, depending on, you know, what is the specified quantile that we are looking at. So, you know, visually, this is what it looks like, you know, depending on which quantile we're focusing on, it's going to look at that and, and give you the estimates. Um, so this is less uh, useful for you, so I'm going to skip this, uh, but basically you could, you could think about different types of examples. One is listed here. You might be, again, interested in looking at, you know, how pension plan eligibility affects um, financial wealth. 
across the diff across the wealth distribution so you might want to look at the 10 percent 25 percent 75 percent 90 percent 95 percent um quantiles so you know typically the the motivation behind using something like this is if we expect that the effects are pretty varied across the wealth distribution that the effect that you know, pension plan eligibility is going to have on financial wealth is going to vary uh, a lot across the distribution, we might want to look at all these different quantiles, okay? Um, and, and typically, you would expect in a question like this, you would, effect, you would expect that the effect would only increase um, and increase sharply as we move up the wealth distribution, right? So if you were, um, you know, at the 95th percentile in terms of the wealth, uh, you're probably like, um, you know, a billionaire. Uh, and, and then you're looking at whether you had pension plan eligibility, you know, how did that affect your uh, financial wealth? That effect is going to be very different than, you know, somebody who is relative to somebody who is at the bottom of the wealth distribution. Okay, so that's the end of chapter nine.